So the idea is, when we see these gills that are infected, because they are introduced in infected farms, of course, and these gills have been vaccinated, the question is, are they infected because the virus can escape this particular vaccine? Hello, welcome to this edition of Meet the Expert, a new series of podcasts on swine disease management in practice presented by Beringer Ingelheim. My name is Peter Best. For this podcast, we're going to talk about the European Research Awards for, on PERS, which are sponsored by Burger Ingelheim. And to help us, we have Dr. Enrique Mathieu, who is Professor of Animal Health at the UAB University in Barcelona in Spain, and also a researcher at CRESA. Would you remind us, please, what is CRESA, yes, Dr. Yes, CRESA Mathieu? is the Research Centre for Animal Health in Catalonia. Thank you. And so you're chairman of this independent review board for this European PERS Research Award. That's yes, correct. Right. How long have you been the chairman of this board? Because this is an annual award, isn't it? Yes, uh, this is my first year as a chairman, but I have been part of the board for from the very beginning of this award. And uh, the board is composed of how many people and we where do they pe- come from? Five Sorry. people coming from different countries in Europe. And they represent academia, they represent practice? Both, both. We have people from the practical part that are field veterinarians and we have people from the academy. So the most recent round of submissions, you've just reached a a decision on the winners, have you? Yes. And uh, how many submissions, more or less, did you receive? Was it sort of tens or twenties or something like uh, that? Yes, normally because this... There is a little bit variation between the years, but normally we are in the range between tens and twenties. And do you look at them whether they're academic or, or practical relevance, or is that one of the considerations you take into account? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we have more academic than proposals from the field because uh, one of the things that we would like to encourage is the participation of field veterinarians. Is it easy to apply? Is this perhaps one of the reasons that veterinarians do not apply, uh, submit more often? It's really easy. <laughs> it's really easy. You only have to go to the website. To don- you have to download the forms, and the forms are something like, what's your name, where do you work, what is your idea about this project, and what will be the impact for the sign industry and for the practical veterinarian, and that's all. And so each of these awards, as I understand it, is 25,000 yeah. euros right. per project. And the research project can cover any area of PERS, right. can not from diagnostics and uh, veterinary practice and so on, right across the board. Uh, on this occasion, then, you've chosen three. Uh, that's normal each year that you would choose three award yes. winners, each receiving 25,000 euros. Why did you choose these particular three, please? What were the standout points in your, in the opinion of the independent board that you chair? Yes, uh, there is a there is a set of criteria for for the selection of the proposals, and in this criteria we consider on 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 uh, in one part of the criteria uh, is about uh, the practical application of the results. There is another part that is about this scientific idea because we want to combine, to have proposals that are sound from a scientific point of view but are also sound from a practical point of view. And then also we consider how feasible is that proposal in, in, in one year period that is the time that is more or less allowed for that and obviously that the amount of money is enough or close to enough for carrying out the work. So the, if I was to look at the website purs.com, I would find how mm-hmm. to apply and I would find the criterion out, outlined right. there to give me an idea what sort of submission you're looking yeah. for and also the form in which you find it acceptable. I don't know whether that's a one-page submission or, or what it is, but uh, you can find all that information yes. online and as these three did. 
Now, these three you, you've chosen, uh, I understand uh, two of them are from Spain and one is from Denmark. Right. Um, what, what were their particular points uh, then? If I may take the one from Denmark, it's talking about repeated uh, vaccinations. Uh, what was the particular point that you appreciated about that? Yeah, the, in this proposal, uh, the, the proponents uh, address a situation that is very common. You are vaccinating the sows in your farm, you are vaccinating the sows every three or four months, and in spite of that, it looks like some sows can be negative in, 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 the, in the test that you use for, for testing the immune response, or maybe you have some cells that are infected in spite of vaccination. And the idea was just to examine what happened in those cases, to have an idea of can be a uh, kind of, uh, let's say, a negative impact because of repeated vaccinations. We don't have an answer. This is the, 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 the idea of the project. But just to understand those animals, those older cells that are negative for, for the uh, routine test, what is the real meaning of those animals in the farm? Older being, uh, could you give me some idea of what you mean by uh, older? In, 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 in a very broad sense. I mean, yes. older mean that have been vaccinated probably 10, 10 times oh, or right. something like that. I, I, I mean, two-year-old animals or something like that. All right. And... We know the protocol of vaccination has been a correct each time. The, the, yeah, the yeah, vaccination yeah, yeah. Uh, the, itself, the, the this, protocol wasn't the question. No, 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 it no, was no. Just the, the effect. The, the, this has been very, very evident from from many years now that uh, some particular animals, for some reason that we cannot understand at the present, uh, had kind of a negative response to say so after repeated vaccination. In in other animal models, this is known that can happen. It's kind of, let's say, habituation to the to the antigen simulation. We don't know in the case of birds, and this is exactly what this project tried to address. Well, could it be host dependent, or probably, it, you know, most probably animal to animal dependent? Mo most probably. Yes, and therefore the information from this study could be of real practical value yeah. in when in determining what the results of looking for immune reactions really mean in practice. Right, it's exactly yeah. that. And the, another is from a, a Spanish colleague, uh, molecular traceability of the virus. Where are we with that particular subject then? Yeah, the idea in that project is uh, simple but very interesting. Um, when you have a production system in which you have different farms that are connected, Yes. Because of the flow of the animals, for example, you are yes. sending gills from one farm to the other, and then the animals that are raised in the farm, the fetters are sent to another place. So and it's so a multi-site right. production right. system. Uh, yes. with, with several farms that are connected in, and, and probably different sources of gills within the company that is serving different farms in the system. One of the critical things is how the pathogens are moving all across the system, all across this network. Because going back to, to, to the idea of the biosecurity, I mean, this movement of the pathogens tell us what are the biosecurity breaches that we have in our system. And regarding PERS, that is another thing. Uh, we can not only identify using these molecular techniques, this flow of the pathogen within the system, but also permit us to do a very practical thing that is to organize the shipment of animals and the use of the trucks. Because uh, the idea is simple. I mean, if you are using a truck going from an infected premise to a, another building that is not infected, or going from farm infected with virus A to farm infected with virus B, then you are mixing everything in the system. So the rational use uh, and the rational organization of the peak flow and the shipment can take advantage of this uh, understanding by molecular so tracing. A, a, a really strong improvement in biosecurity right. for, as a result of this at a relatively uh, low, affordable cost. Low I cost. Should, uh, a low cost. Yeah. So it is open to anybody with a multi-site production system mm -hmm. with a, uh, on the advice of their veterinarian to be uh, looking at the uh, possibility of doing this. Hey. If they decided, and they're not doing it already, 
what would be the first step in the molecular traceability? What does that mean in terms of the first step? Yeah, the, it's very simple, just sequencing. Sequencing the... the taking the, samples yeah, from each step. Ta taking the animals that are... Selected samples, you know, w w one would choose particular animals at particular stages. Yeah, since, since, since in, in a production system, you know, the flow of the animals and the age of the animals, it's just, you can just target... Yes. the things that are of interest for you. Yeah. I mean, if you are, for example, moving gills from site one to farm two, three, and four, you can test gills before the exit from south farm to the other farm. So if you are identifying the virus that you have in the south farm and then you can identify the virus in the destination farms, you can know more or less how this virus is moving in the system. And, and the good thing of the project, I think that a positive point is that this system can be translated not only to birds, but to any other pathogen that we want to trace in our system. Is the project looking at something that's already happening to a degree, or is it looking at the earlier stages of the idea and seeing whether it is practically applicable? Well, well we have a uh, lot of evidences in this type of systems that there are, you know, the different strains that you can have in the systems can move within the system. And so we know that this happened just looking at, at our five. The problem is that we don't have the whole picture. And, and, and we have just pieces of this picture and, and, and the project try to have more or less a, a whole picture in a given situation. You are listening to Meet the Expert a new series of podcasts on swine disease management in practice presented by Boehringer Ingelheim. If you would like to know more about the subject we're discussing in this podcast, additional information is available offline. May I move on to the third one, which is uh, again from Spain, and uh, it's... Uh, talking about cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes uh, in gilts after vaccination. What is the significance of looking at those lymphocytes? Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit related to the first one from, from Denmark. I mean, they use a concept that is, uh, I think, is, is shared by many researchers right now. It's the idea that in spite of the vaccination, you have some animals that can be infected. And what we don't really know is that the causes behind that. Uh, when you look at the acclimation protocols that we have for guilds, uh, basically you can find three different types of systems for doing that. You have the farms that, is, that are purchasing older guilds, and they have these guilds just for six weeks, eight weeks in the farm before the first service. So they have a very narrow window for doing the acclimation and the quarantine. Then you have the, the farms that use a different system, starting with 80 kilo live weight gills or something like that, a wider window. And then you have the farms that, have, that start with very young gills, 20 kilos or so. So they have months for doing the acclimation. So the idea is, when we see these gills that are infected, because they are introduced in infected farms, of course, and these gills have been vaccinated, the question is, are they infected because the virus can escape this particular vaccine? Or are they infected because the development of full immunity takes time, and we know that it takes time? Or they are infected because the schedule of acclimation is not enough with one vaccination or two vaccinations? And we know that this protection comes from two sides, the neutralizing antibodies and the cell-mediated immunity. And for the neutralizing antibodies, many years uh, from now, it was shown that if you are able to reach a given title of immunity of neutralizing antibodies, the animal is more or less protected for transplacental infection. But we know nothing about cytotoxic lymphocytes. And we have, we believe for many years that it was impossible to detect um, uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes in cells. But this last year, there was a paper showing that using a different approach, maybe it could. 
A different approach in what way? Technical push? approach. Uh -huh. Because uh, the, the problem is about quantities of cells that you can examine. So, so the more refined the technology, you can see things that you couldn't before. And now we have the possibility to examine combining molecular techniques, combining flow cytometry, combining sorting uh, capabilities. We are able to select very few numbers of cells with specificity for the virus and to check what those cells are doing. And, and this is the approach of, of the idea. Look at gills with different systems of acclimation or with different situations and compare. Compare those that are infected when exposed to the infected farm with those that are not infected using the same protocol. And this is about the question, is the protocol or is the host? If it's the protocol, we have means to change the protocol, to produce better protocol for acclimation, to decide it's better to start with younger gills or not, or it doesn't matter if they are young or they are old. If uh, it's about the host, that's a completely different yes. picture. <laughs> you don't want to change every pig on every side. Each of your examples, of your three winners this time, then uh, potentially the results they're going to give are going to have real practical value, real right. practical significance. Uh, how quickly could you one expect to see answers from these projects? And more, where should one expect to find them? Would they be available through PERS.com or presented at international conferences? Or how do those results yeah. come to the um, public? The uh, the period for the execution of the project is one year. It must be one year. It must be one year. And and we understand that uh, certainly when you are doing research, this is not math. Sometimes you say one year and you need 15 months. Okay, that's fine. It's not a problem. But we expect that all our worthies can produce results, can produce something that can be, you know, disseminated to the public opinion in this one year period. Maybe it's not full 100% done, but substantial results that can be meaningful for the people in this one year period. And disseminated how? Where, where would the field vet or may find those results? Yeah, there, there, are, there are some very obvious, um, let's say, targets for dissemination. One is the journals that are dealing with this scientific, this type of scientific information. Then you have the journals or the, or the papers that are more in, 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 in the, let's say, um, public, general public dissemination. And then you have this type of, of, of events like the European Symposium of Procyte Health and Management, this type of events that I think that gather many, many, many people that are, that are working on the area of peak health and production. In, in practice, that, yes. Right, that, that are good targets for this dissemination. So we encourage them very strongly to present uh, this type of events and this type of papers. The awards have been going each year since 2014. Have there been a, a history of producing some excellent results which have been of great practical significance? Yes, I think that we have, I mean... All the awardees have produced good results, but I think that we have some good examples of this practical application of the results. Uh, I remember here, for example, uh, a work from uh, this guy, Jordi Valiellas, about the use of processing fluids for testing. Uh, one of the problems that we have in the farms, from the practical point of view, for testing animals is bleeding. Bleeding is not something that we want to do <laughs> because we have to handle pigs, we have to bleed pigs, we have to, to use needles. Nobody likes to do that. And when you talk about very, very, very young piglets, one day old or something like that, you know that there is also risk. Bleeding a one day old piglet or a very young piglet can cause harm to the animal. So it's better to avoid that. So the use of these processing fluids that are Nothing else that the fluids that are produced by collecting, for example, if you are doing tail docking or something like that, collecting this type of things can be an alternative. And uh, they produce results showing the, 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 the potential of this type of systems, obviously with the limitations that the regulations indicate about this type of, of practices. Uh, I remember another one from, from the group at the ANSYS, uh, Olivier Boutry, for example, in which they were studying uh, the interference with maternal antibodies or, for example, the interference with influenza infection. 
and they demonstrated that uh, influenza infection can interfere with the development of, of immunity to PERS. Just because influenza is producing a very strong immune response that can, at some extent, block the replication of the live virus that we have in the vaccine. So this is very practical. I mean, if you are in the middle of, of a moment in which influenza virus is circulating, think twice before vaccination. So the barrier potentially from immune, uh, influenza A virus yeah. infection, was this known before this work was uh, done? Not, or, or? not exactly. I mean, for many years it, have been known that it was known that influenza induced a very high interferon offer response. But one thing is to know that, and the other thing is to see what happens when this infected animal is being vaccinating, is being vaccinated because in the farm you cannot have this picture because you are not normally testing for influenza animals before vaccination. Yes. And uh, nowadays most of the influenza, influenza infections are subclinical. So, and and I think that this was practical, or or I was remembering, for example. Another paper about the uh, um, the use of umbilical cords for testing pus just to assess the stability or the instability of the farms. Umbilical cords are very easy to collect. It, this is completely harmless from for the piglet, so it was a good alternative. So we have plenty of examples of and, that. And, and so the example you gave there with the the research uh, does it give us a, a, a very good idea what to do? If you're going to be, for example, vaccinating wean piglets, taking account of whether or not influenza A is present. Mm -hmm. So perhaps doing these readily available materials as a test to see whether these other agents are present right. well, would be a, a, a practical alternative and an easier thing than taking bloods in the right. traditional way. Right, that's the idea. Will there be a progression of such a project? Is it finished after 12 months, or is there a, another step that, that needs to go on? Uh, it depends. Sometimes are, you know, projects with a clear start and a clear end. This is the goal, and once we have the goal, this is the practical application of, of this project and so on. But I think that uh, many other projects... The end of the project is just the starting of of something else. So and and maybe it's not up to us at this moment to say if they have to continue or not. But uh, I think that most of this of of this research, like any other research, is just a you know step by step. You have one result, and this result open new questions. So this open a uh, way for new projects for new research again. Uh, certainly, uh, I've been interested to, over time, uh, read and hear about the investigation of uh, variants and of strain differences in PERS. And some, uh, many of this is sequencing looking only at the all five open reading frame. And others are saying whole genome or you know, a wider thing. And I believe, you know, some of the answers have already started to come from uh, your uh, PERS award projects in the past. Would you expect that, that to be a fertile area, for example, where mm -hmm. research will have to look, what are we doing in terms of identifying this diversity? Yeah, for, and how much information do we need to for, do that? For example, you mentioned this sequencing thing, and, and we have one example, this uh, work by done by Dormans and, and colleagues in the Netherlands, in which they show very clearly, for example, the use of sequencing different segments of the genome. So I think that this type of, of approaches can, as I said before, can produce new information for gaining understanding, for gaining depth in the identification of these gaps that we have in the knowledge of the disease. So you would certainly say that the annual PERS Research Awards, sponsored by Boeing, as we said, have a relevance. They've already given, shown value and they continue to have relevance because there is still research out there that needs to be done and continued and supported. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And this is a European award and this is across all European yeah, countries. Yeah, and, and I think that this is an added value. I mean, this pan-European concept. Very good. 
Dr. Mathieu, thank you very much indeed. Very May welcome. I just take the moment to remind our, our friends who are listening to this podcast, we've referred to uh, the information which is available on the website pers.com regarding application and uh, about the board that you chair, some uh, information about the members of the board, the constitution and so on, and it helps to answer the practical questions of somebody who might consider making a submission. If, if I may add a word, I would like to encourage practitioners to present proposals. I, uh, I can understand that, and I would say to every practitioner, please listen to this podcast and give it consideration. We're talking, in this case, on a European award, but I'm sure in a more general sense, the more practitioners can help us by organizing and leading and uh, fulfilling projects, then that's going to be to the benefit of us all. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. You have been listening to a Meet the Expert podcast presented by Boehringer Ingelheim. Please note that other podcasts in the series are becoming available. Stay tuned and thank you for listening.